Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Monica. Hello. Hey, how are you, Christian? I'm doing well. For folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, I'm Monica Rathbun. I'm based out of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, I've been doing performance tuning, especially for the last 25 years. I'm a consultant with Denny Cherry and Associates, and uh, MVP for oh, maybe seven years now. I don't know. Let me count my little disc. I think I'm on seven. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and, and it's, uh, I, I see that you're also, you've been involved with formerly, I don't know if it's been rebranded to SQL Saturdays. Yes. Uh, I saw like data Saturdays. You're in Virginia beach. I mean, that's where the SharePoint Saturday started. I know. And you actually used to have a combination user group, SharePoint SQL server user group, but now I've run the SQL server user group. I think I'm on nine years now that I've been running it and did a data Saturday, well, SQL Saturday at the time mm -hmm. in 2020 for the first time, big success. Um, and then we tried for 2021 or 20, whatever the year was for COVID and had to cancel it last minute and all went down from there. But uh, user group still going strong. SQL Saturday, data Saturdays on the list, not for this year, but probably next year. So We're doing the same thing. Yeah, we did our last one. Uh, we did our SharePoint Saturday event, or we called it the M365 Saturday. Well, actually, Friday. We moved it to Friday. Anyway, uh, but we were a slight rebrand, same team, been doing it for almost a decade, but was the February of 2020. And so, yeah, we're starting, we're going to do our first one again in uh, March 1st of next year of 2024. So excited to get those things starting up. Um, how are how are those events doing in general? Are they popping up again? Are they? They is... are. They're, they're picking up steam, okay. for sure, picking up steam. Um, I know the user groups are still trying to get their footing too and getting those going so you can build up to the, the day to Saturday and stuff. Um, I think the biggest problem right now is getting speakers, believe it or not. We can get the bodies, but getting speakers to actually travel and commit is uh, still a challenge for everybody. Well, I know that it's still, yeah, I mean, that's an issue for some international folks. Like we used to, to do like a 250, 300 person event here in Utah. Um, we would still bring in four or five international speakers oh, yeah. and people from across the U.S. And yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how that, I, and I know folks are starting to, to travel for other events. I was just in Australia um, last month, um, you know, a couple of European trips that are being planned. It's starting to pick up. You're seeing people come to the U.S. as well. So that's always good to see. I think that was what was making everybody nervous. Those that are event organizers, will people sponsor and show up? Um, of course we get, if you're doing hybrid, especially you can get virtual dollar, virtual sponsors, people that'll throw money to right. help, you know, put it together. But what was your, so what was your path to becoming MVP? It's been a few years, but what was your origin story? Oh, so been doing the DBA thing for a really long time. And then I met some people and they, of course, you know, volunteered me to speak and start speaking. And I don't know if you know who Re Irish is. But she runs the MVP program for the data platforms. Yeah. Um, and uh, she and I met, she used to work for me. I hired her and she saw what I was doing and she said, I am not getting paid enough. I am not doing enough. I should be doing more and kind of pushed me out the door, got a new job, started getting into the SQL community, like really into the SQL community. And then I'm very kind of outspoken. And everybody's like, you need to do a session on performance tuning. You need to do a session on performance tuning. At the time, I was a lone DBA. So I went with what I knew and did the yeah. whole lone DBA speaking thing at Spartansburg in 2015. Mm -hmm. From there, I, I got into the speaking bug and then started writing and applied. Well, not didn't apply. Got uh, nominated for MVP and got it the first time out. Uh, actually got uh, got it the same day we did on April Fool's Day. We both thought it was a joke. It was like, oh my gosh, we just got this. And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. So that was 2017. So about two years from my starting a speaking, I uh, got into the writing and started to grow that way. And then now it's international speaking everywhere, writing a blog, doing all that great stuff, webinars left and right. Uh, and I absolutely love it. So, How, you know, and, and that's, I, I realized that when I, when I talk to people about and mentor people about becoming MVPs and uh, talk about the process, you get a lot of people that say, it's like, ah, I don't know about presenting. I could do a lot of the other things. 
how, how do you respond to, to people about like what they should do if they want to follow that path? Well, it's just, first of all, being voluntold and kind of getting pushed is a kind of really great way to get out the door because sometimes you just barely want to put your toe in the water and you need somebody to just kind of push you in uh, to do it. So taking the advice, getting the mentor to look at your stuff and know that you have something to give a, as value, right? Nobody wants to listen to me. I've got the same story as everybody else. Somebody else has covered this topic, all of this great stuff. And everybody tells it different. Everybody's had a totally different a uh, way of learning or experience and everything. So it's just a matter of, hey, get out there, tell your story. Somebody in that audience is going to learn different from you than me. You have value. You know, go out there and and just just do it. Um, so I have them pick a topic like mine was the loan DBA thing. You know, pick a topic that is true to you that you can just tell the story. It doesn't have yeah, to be yeah. extremely technical because everybody gets stuck up on the technical stuff, right? Somebody's going to correct me or I'm going to be wrong on something or whatever. And, uh, you know, you've got to get them out of that thought. And it's, you know, your story. Tell your story. You know, well, how did you... That is important. The storytelling aspect of that, because when you talk about, well, a lot of us, you know, covering technical topics mm -hmm. and there's there's certainly there are different approaches on the technology side to solving different problems. But, you know, with a lot of what we're doing, especially when we're talking about Microsoft products and solutions, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of talking about and sharing the same information. So it is more about the, the story and those personal experiences The I see, I give the same guidance to people about writing. I've had people say, it's like, well, you know, I've, I've read, and there's plenty of content on this, like not in your voice, not with your experience, your story. Exactly. Denny always tells us he's big on blogging and sometimes you just get the writer's block, right? Somebody's already written this. What do I write or whatever? He's like, just put 400 words down. 400 words about what did you see? Did you get an error that just happened? Did you see something really cool? Do you have a tip? Do you have something of, hey, you saw somebody do this and that might have been not a great example. Let me give a quick example. And if you can do that in 400 words, which is what, a paragraph, maybe a paragraph and a half? Yeah, it two, maybe. It can be two or three paragraphs, the shorter right. paragraphs, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, shorter, exactly. Just do it. And you should be able to write 400 in half an hour and then it's out the door. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be this big, long blog with all of these graphs and code and this technical stuff. People don't necessarily read that. So yeah, jumping in and doing the blog thing. It, I, I just asked somebody the question. I said, like, what, what's your average word count on the articles on your blog post? Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, I don't know, it's probably, you know, a couple thousand. It was like, I said, you know, you're there. And sometimes that's the right number of words. I've written longer, plenty of longer mm -hmm. things uh, around an idea. Certainly if you're going to write something like an ebook, uh, a white paper, right. something like that. But for a blog post, how many ideas you're combining? Like, you know, you could stretch that into a five part series where you exactly. go through each of the pieces. Why are you killing yourself over this longer technical, longer piece, which fewer people are going to read? I was going to say, how many people make it past the first two paragraphs? Okay. They just like, okay. Or if they scan it and just get the bold words or whatever links that you put down or whatever picture, you just scroll through it and be done. So all of that time, exactly. Break it down to five. Then you schedule one a week and then you got five weeks taken care of, right? You know, one of the things that I was nervous about when I started presenting in on more technical topics and doing demos, well, one was the demos working, were my VMs running, like all that fun. Uh, and then, then I started somebody uh, uh, wiser, much wiser said, pre-record those demos mm -hmm. and just, just run through that and talk through it as you go through. It's still a demo. Yep. Um, but was somebody was trying to prepare me for being heckled. And uh, mm -hmm. have you ever had that where somebody like called you out or corrected you or, mm -hmm. or, or challenged you on something? Yeah, that's happened, but it's usually, uh, so it's one of those women in tech things. It's usually more of a comment rather than a question or, you know, what have you. Um, and you, you've got to deal with those kind of things, but most of the time, no. Um, I've gotten pretty good audiences so far um, yeah. in all the sessions that I've spoken at. Not too much of that. Uh, usually speakers and other people in the room, if you, at least we try, if there's something that was nece not necessarily correct, you know, you talk to them after the fact, maybe in the hallway or in the speaker yeah. room or, hey, by the way, you know, let's check this out. Let's prove that this might not be correct. And then we can, 
you know, maybe you can adjust your session or something, but I haven't had. See, that's know, been my experience too. I, I, and I, I kind of feel, I feel bad. Like, you know, have I, I would like somebody just to outright correct me if I got something wrong. I, I like to think that I've, you know, that while my content has been perfect, the reality is it's, it's not, I've shared things where like, here's my understanding. And I like, like you, I mean, I've had people that have said, well, I've experienced this and here's how I've resolved this adding on to that. Um, but you know, the one time I had somebody, somebody else, other people in the room thought they were heckling, but this person was doing this, was adding on, was extending. And I've also seen this, like, I don't think that quite solves the problem and, and add to it. And I'm good friends with that person now. I didn't know them then, um, but I went back and modified my content to answer that question. So I thanked him profusely for helping me out on that that topic. But I, 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 I kind of want to have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still get nervous when somebody that you know that is really good in whatever you do uh, sits in your sessions? And I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, this person is in my session. I'm gonna, you know, I'm waiting uh, for them to to do something. I, I don't personally, uh, because, you know, one is confidence in your topic and your right. material. Like I generally only speak on things that I know really well. I, I am like, and I, this isn't like a vanity thing. It's like, I'm a subject matter expertise yeah. on certain things. That's what I concentrate on. Uh, and then I'm, I try to, when I'm venturing into areas that are new and new features that are out there lean on the expert. So if I've got somebody in the room, if it's a product team member or another MVP or RD that is densely, you know, uh, uh, writing about and speaking on that, that topic, I'll probably quote them in that material. In fact, if I recognize, I just did this at, at, uh, about a month ago where somebody was sitting in the room and I actually referenced something she wrote about on the topic. Mm -hmm. Wasn't in my slide, but I actually pointed to her and said, ah, here, here's a person that you should ask questions about like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way that you can, it's kind of like giving out candy at the beginning of like, if you're teaching like children, you give out candy at the beginning of it. They're usually more better behaved throughout the, the period. If you, if you stroke the egos of the strong personalities <laughs> in the room and, and, and you catch that early, um, then they are more constructive and helpful throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is when I was younger, when I was first starting and those big names would sit in my sessions and stuff like that. Now I don't, cause I'm friends with all of them, yeah. but, um, now it's not that at all. I know but... they're chinks in their armor. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in the beginning, that can be really intimidating when you yeah, go and yeah. sit in somebody's session and they're like, Oh, don't sit in here. You know, I'm, I'm worried, you know, that you're going to correct something or, or what have you, they get nervous because whoever it is is sitting in the room. So, Well, isn't part of that though, having humility as a speaker, as a presenter in the first place? I mean, there I mean, are some people that go in there are so arrogant and, and, and where people then almost feel like they have to call you out on that, find problems in that. But if you're going in there, if you are, you know, you're telling a couple of jokes, you're being personable, um, you know, uh, that, then people generally want to see you succeed and, learn from you and add to it and make it more interactive. Yep. I agree. I agree with that. So the hardest thing for me is when you get those audiences where nobody's asking questions. Oh my gosh. So we spoke at SQL Saturday. Um, God, where was it? Uh, it wasn't India, Singapore. And over in Singapore, apparently it's rude to ask questions or interrupt a speaker or anything. So I don't know if you've ever done something over there it's silent. Yeah. Like, and it's respectable silent, but you're sitting in there and you're talking, there is no engagement whatsoever. And I always pull engagement from my audience. Yeah. And it was just, and I had just come from India. We had done D DPS, uh, Data Platform Summit over in India. And then the following week, we did Singapore. So it was really interactive yeah. over in yeah. India. And then we went and we're like, so we're all coming back to the speaker room, but that was eerie. That was weird. I wasn't talking to anyone. And it was all just the cultural yeah, cultural thing, totally that, different. Well, that's why I, I, I try to, and I always say at the beginning of my sessions, like, if you've got questions, like interrupt, like I'm not a question at the end. Like mm -hmm. let's, I, I, I want something that's timely, that's in context like that. But I mean, some speakers don't like that. They want to get through their material, but I, I, I'm, I look at that as sometimes when I, like, I just had this situation, ran out of time, didn't get through all the material. I said, look, I've got this other stuff that's in the slides. 
but we went slightly sideways with other questions and there was value there. It was, it, I enjoyed it. People came up and said it was a great session afterwards. They got a lot out of that. And it just like, look, you read the slides for the few other things. I try to create content with all the notes and everything in it anyway. So it's, it's downloadable, but yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's interesting. It's good when you're doing international speaking to, to, to get a vibe of, you know, talk to other locals, like wh what is the audience like? Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Total, total difference. Cause I actually have a slide in mind that has my presentation rules. I'm like, interrupt me. Let's have a conversation. If you had something, because it's performance tuning, if I tell you to do this one thing and then you did that before and it was adverse effect, let us know because all of our environments are different. Let's have the conversation. Don't really worry about the slide deck. Let's learn from each other. And that's, you know, one of my first slides. Let's, let's just get into it. And we have yeah, it, it, it's hard. I, I, mean, I always tell people, it's like, good, good audience. I used to do something similar to that. I, I haven't in a, in a while, but um, I, I used to advise, like, have questions that you're trying to answer. And I think I like that style. I like it when presenters say, hey, we're going to cover this material. What questions do you have? And they list them out, even whiteboard them and say, we're going to answer these three. These other two are outside of this. Let's mm -hmm. talk about this afterwards. You know, come up and let's have a conversation. Um, but that's a great way. It's a form of expectation setting. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it always goes more positive when people know. I can't remember who said it. It says like, you know, tell them what you're going to, what you're going to talk about you talk about those things and then recap what you talked about exactly so outline that so they know what they're getting there they know that the coverage was there well especially if they have other places that they can choose right there's other sessions going on at the same time i have no problem if you had an expectation that i'm going to cover this this and that and when i let you know what i'm going to cover if it's not falling into that and you're going to get more benefit from another session get up walk out go to the other one it's not about me it's about yep. what you're going to learn right so yep. setting yep. the expectation of what you're going to cover I think that's really important in the beginning. I love that too. Yeah. Uh, that's especially if you're going to go, like I remember doing, it was down in, uh, I think we did it both in Johannesburg and Cape Town, but we, where we combined SharePoint Saturday and SQL Saturday events, they were huge events. I remember the one in Cape Town. And so usually you might get in, in a session down in Cape Town with 200, 250 mm -hmm. people at the event might get like, 25 30 people in my session and this one was packed standing room only people around the back um and it was people that were obviously they, they weren't experts in that that topic they came from the sequel side of things fantastic questions out of that session so what types of events are you doing is it just these community events oh no, no, no so um i'm going to belgium uh, for, oh, I forget what it's called. At the beginning of October, there is a conference in yep. Belgium. My uh, team is going to be there. I won't be there. Oh, yeah. yeah. What is it called? Yeah. Ah, it's just blowing my mind for a minute. Uh, um, yeah. So I've got it in teams and on our, I our do too. Just, I'm scrolling to see. I know I'm not going to be. Just had this conversation. I know. Oh. Okay, so anyways, I'm going to be in Belgium. Uh, I did SQL bits this year. I do some SQL Saturdays, Data Saturdays. I did Data Grilling. We did, um, oh, so many this year. Lots of different international ones. We're kind of focusing on some of those right now yeah. um, because we couldn't for a while. Um, I do virtual events and webinars all the time. Uh, user groups, I go down uh, in person. I'm trying to get in person more and more um, to user groups because I run one. I know what it, it's yeah. like to get the speakers to get them in the room. Um, so I try to do... Uh, hopefully between five and 10 events a year. Um, if I can, uh, sometimes if they can book them back to back, that's the best, right? I can hit one and then, and then right. the other. Um, oh, I did Poland. I did one in Poland this year. Um, oh, was that the, um, was it the, was it a collab days or was it the AMS or? No, it was a sequel one. Uh, you're going to kill me on names. I'm blanking out. <laughs> I'm going to check my session eyes. <laughs> it's all in there. It makes it so easy when it's in session eyes, right? Because they're all of the sessions are, are sitting in there. Let's see my events. What did I just do? I just did. Nope. Past events. Oh, what was SQL day in May? SQL day. Okay. SQL day. 
So yeah, that one's, uh, that one was data mines, data mines in Belgium is what I'm doing. Okay. So that's the one in October. So a couple of weeks from now, I'm doing a pre-con there, um, all day pre-con on Monday. And then I have, um, a session on temp DB, I think. Um, so, you know, both technical this time. Um, so yeah. Well, one, one last question on uh, user group focus. Like, so how are you with, with things have gotten very diffused? Uh, again, we used to be a SharePoint user group, and now we're just a Microsoft technology group. We cover a wide variety of topics that are within that, which can make it difficult to find like that audience and, and pull them in. And so we're doing like a lot of user groups are like post COVID. How do we start it up again? And, and, you know, so, so what are you doing? Have you made any adjustments or changes? Um, so we haven't stopped. We've had a meeting every month, except for, for one hurricane, uh, in the last nine years. So we never stopped. I kept virtual. We never missed a meeting. Um, we just got back in person because we lost our venue due to COVID. Uh, so I finally found a new home for us and we got back in person in March. Uh, so I'm just now building it up and getting those speakers in and, and trying to build that audience again. We try to stay as SQL focused as possible, but we're branching out from just the engine. So we'll have Databricks. Somebody talked about AI as it relates to SQL and, and some of those other topics, Power BI, if we need to, there's a Power BI group. So I try not to do that unless right. we want to merge groups for the thing. Um, and we're starting to get bodies back in, which is good. Uh, so we're averaging between 14 and 25 people coming in since March. Now, will that fall off? I don't know. Um, so we're trying to stay that focused so I can get my core group back together. Um, for now, we'll see. Uh, transitioning from hybrid has been interesting and from uh, being virtual has been interesting, of course, because we were able to branch out and people from all over the US and you know countries or whatever could join the meetings. Yeah. Um, so we'll see if I get some legs and we keep going um, in person. I did find, because I work with a lot of different groups, those that have gone hybrid that have them in person and virtual are failing. Yeah. They're failing because it's so easy not to go in. Right. You RSVP and say you're going to come. And then you've had a long day. You work from home. You decide you don't want to leave the house. So yep. you watch it virtually. Right. So it ends up with three people in the room before you'll get your sponsor, you'll get your speaker, you'll get the leader. And then you might get one other person in the room and everybody else is watching virtual. So you have a speaker fly in and there's no bodies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so that's the challenge um, doing the hybrid thing. I know why they do it and those that record it, but it, I think it's got to get away from that mode. We've got to get out of it to get the bodies back. Well, in. you lose all the benefits of the in person, uh, you know, the networking and everything. That. No, we're having that discussion. It's like for our collab days in, in next March 1st, um, we said we're not going to do any video, we're not going to do any hybrid. It's we, you've got to be there. Uh, well, and that too. And then I have a thing when I do anything virtual, I don't have them record my sessions yeah. unless it's like for a big conference and it's part of the contract. But if you're speaking to 10 user groups, it's different when we were in person and it's 10 unique audiences and everything. So your whole session is different. But right. when you do something virtual, your session almost stays the same. It gets recorded and then you've got 20 copies of there of the same session. Or why does somebody want to pick that session for the next conference when it's recorded out there or right. what have you, right? You, you miss all of that. So um, I'm trying to get away from that and encouraging other user groups. You know, I know that's something everybody likes. We've gotten into this, let's stay home and watch things, right. but you're not going to get that transition if we don't. Yeah, no, that's a, the exact conversation we're having. And I, no, I agree. I mean, we even talked about um, for when we've done the hybrid and we've done that only make the recordings available for 30 days and then wipe them for that, for that reason. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's something we discuss with our, with our speakers as well yeah. to make sure. Cause we, we do want to bring people in that are, you know, we, we have uh, folks that are, um, say professional speakers, they're trainers, they're out doing that. And so that kind of content, they don't want to have a recording of that out there. They're out there trying to make a living on that mm -hmm. content, that expertise as well. So you need to be sensitive to that. Yep. Right. Yep, Exactly. Well, Monica, really appreciate your time and, and getting to 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 meet you now. And I'm I'm sure we'll uh, we'll probably cross paths at the next MVP Summit or Sounds one of these other uh, events. I'm doing more and more events. I'll be out on the road, I think six or seven more times this year. Um, I think just I'm adding some like community day, uh, some 
SharePoint Saturday type events as well, just trying to get coverage of smaller events as well. And like you talked about, I'm trying to wrap that into, hey, there's a big event, like I'm doing Live 360 in Orlando, and I'm doing Twin Cities before that, and then heading out. So nice. it's good to combine. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. I'm missing live 360. I'll be in Seattle for uh summit. I, uh, yeah. Oh, for, for, uh, uh, ignite. Yeah. It's in the yeah. same building, same week. Yeah. I, I know. So I, that was, I was torn, uh, between doing the two events. So, mm -hmm. but understood. anyway, well, appreciate the time for folks that want to contact you, reach out to you, connect with you. Where are you most active? Where can they find you? Oh, I'm SQL espresso everywhere. So you can find me on my website, Twitter, Blue Sky, Mastodon, all of them. Uh, SQL Espresso, best way to get a hold of me. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Okay. Have a great one. Thank you so much.